first, Tommy, why don't you just take us through your hockey journey, kind of, you know, give us a little backstory, you know, who'd you play for in youth hockey, prep school, USHL and Harvard, what, maybe pro a little bit. Why don't you just take, take us through your hockey journey to start us off? Yeah, so um, way back in the day, the 92 Kings, I played with uh, George's brother Gunner way back in the day for a bit. Um, uh, for the 92 King, we were talking Massachusetts. And the St. Sebastian's met the lovely Ryan Coffey. Um, and uh, made that team junior year. I didn't really, didn't really, it was a late bloomer, as they say. Yeah, uh, wait, before you, go any, before you go any further there, Tommy, don't take this the wrong way, but as a freshman, you were probably like 5'9", would you say? You were shorter, yeah. and you, were, and you yeah. weren't good. You were yeah. like nowhere near being able to make varsity hockey at the time. Yeah. No offense. You just no, I was good when I was like young, like eight, nine, ten. And then like middle school, I just like dipped, got a little chubby, wasn't growing, wasn't getting tall. You know, they had the ice cream machine that takes out. Like there wasn't much I could do. So I had to adjust to the ice cream machine. Um, but no, yeah. So then, then uh, yeah, then I made it. Then sophomore year, I really uh, got my confidence up, to put it euphemistically. Yeah, yeah, really got the confidence yeah. up there, and then you made it your junior year. And I did you commit to Harvard before you played a varsity hockey game, or before you were officially on varsity? No, so I played my junior year. Oh, okay. Mid August, going into my senior year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, then uh, played. Yeah, and so when I committed, and they were like, "We might have you do a year, might have you come in," but they were leaning towards having me do a year, so I ended up doing that. In, uh, I was in Omaha for half the year, and I got traded to Sioux Falls. And uh, that was cool out there. We got a couple. Uh, you played in Sioux City, right, Sean? I did. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, that was uh, – I liked it out there. It was good. I, it was, uh, both the teams – You got you got, tra- uh, you got traded? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, oh, yeah, like right in the middle of the season. Traded to uh, a better but, team yeah, or like, worse team? Hours, yeah. What? Better team or a worse team? They were both really good. We actually ended up um, playing each other in the semis. So they're both good teams. Um, Sioux Falls I liked more. Omaha was just very strict in every aspect, like on the ice system. Like Sioux Falls, we didn't play systems, literally. The guy was like, just go play hockey. It was sick. (laughs) Who was your coach in Sioux Falls? Uh, Hartzell. Oh, yeah. And so he literally just literally no systems at all. He was just let us go play, which was sick. Um, yep. And we were really good. And so we beat Omaha in the semi or the quarters, maybe whatever it was, and then lost in the semis. Um, but yeah, I liked I, both teams. Had a lot of good guys. I, I did. I got lucky. Good couple of good groups. Groups. Can guys. I uh, can I jump in here? Of course. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. But we nope. were uh, talking about the USHL draft that happened a couple of days ago, and part of bringing you on in your story and connecting to me and Sean and Ryan. How did you find the transition from going from St. Sebastian to the USHL? I know I found it. I was shocked how good the league was, and I was worried I wasn't going to be able to play through it. But I kind of figured it out a little bit. And once I got to college, I go, you know what? That that league really made me a better player. It was hard made me a better player yeah it was, you feel? it was it was really good i mean i was i almost went to i almost went to vernon in the bchl i was like really close to going there um get your points up yeah i, I, I should have yeah get your points up <laughs> right should have. um no but i do okay in the ushl but i yeah bchl I, everyone was like oh you should go it's like very offensive all that kind of stuff but then i went to the camp and like i got i got like uh um like very enamored with the idea of it. Like I had the big tryout and they like they were like, Oh, we want you and all this stuff. And um so, and I had like a good tryout and then they were like, We want you to come in, you're playable, blah, blah blah. So then I was all excited just like hearing them say that, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, that that yeah. league, like when you make a team in that league, it really it, it's showtime. Yeah. It was good. But yeah, a lot of good I mean, so many good players on every team. Like they all all D one guys, obviously for, for the most part, and then like all of them were going. To, I had like ten Minnesota guys on both those teams combined. Like that everyone sucks. was just going to like Minnesota, Denver. But it was good. I found um, I did I did a little better in Sioux Falls than 
Omaha, but I did all right in both places. Um, yeah. But the hockey was really strong. And especially it got you ready for the ECAC in particular. Yeah, the ECAC. Um, how did how did uh, being cut from Saint Sab? Did you say did you get cut twice? Um, uh, how yeah. did that kind of? I mean, how did that? They didn't that even let you for the on the ice or? They didn't even let him on the ice freshman. No, no, I'm <laughs> I'm being serious here because I think being cut at a, at a young age like that can really propel you to great things to experience what it feels like to say. You know, we don't need you, so I'm going to come back and prove you wrong. Did you have any of that in junior and then in college? Or um, were you just like, eh, I'm just going to come out here and dangle? Um, do you mean, did that affect, did you mean, um, did getting cut, like, motivate me in juniors and college? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or did it make you mentally stronger? How did you take yeah. it at the time? I was, I was definitely, like, rattled at the time. Uh, yeah. Like Ryan said, like, I honestly wasn't, I, I could have made it myself for year. Like, I yeah. probably for sure, for sure. I should have made it. I mean, Gunner took it. Gunner took it well. I remember. Gunner both got cut. We both, yeah, <laughs> we both made it. But um, but it was uh, yeah, it was tough, especially to see all my friends playing, obviously. And I was on JV with guys who were like, had like football as their first sport. <laughs> you know, they're playing football gear out there. Yeah, like, and so it was, just, it was it was tough. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that kind of like resilience and all that kind of stuff kind of kept continuing um, and I was kind of used to it and kind of learned how to battle through that kind of stuff yeah well I guess uh, I guess if you have the hands and uh, the IQ like you did you just kind of figure it out in your mind right what's uh I want to get to those, IQ that, and those, ass. Uh, that yeah, the biggest game. ass you've ever seen from this kid I used to love when this kid talked about Datsuk but we're gonna get to that I oh. want to hear about Talk about the high level of players at Harvard you play with. Uh, Killhorn, I remember he was a nightmare to play against. Yeah. His habits, maybe. VC was electric to play against. And uh, yeah. even a guy like Foot, a smaller kind of just like worker, like didn't wow you, but look at the, the career he's made, right? So talk about those guys and what it was like to play with them. Yeah. Um, they were all amazing. Like, uh, did you mention Killer, Jimmy, and, and Kerfoot? Yeah. Yeah, for Jim, I mean, Jimmy's the best goal scorer I've ever played with. Like, around the net. I've never seen anyone score. He had 32 goals, I think, in 36 games one year in the ECAC, which is preposterous. Wow. That, that's, that's, like, ridiculous. So, I, he's just, like, the best goal scorer. He's, like, very competitive. He's tough. But he's, uh, he's like, un unbelievable. And Kill, yeah, Kalorin was just dominant. I mean, Jimmy was dominant, too, but... Kaloran was just like I think I think he might have been the best player in the country that year. My freshman year of college, he was a senior. Every game he we played like Nodak over Christmas break. They had like Christo and all these guys were supposed to be like and kill. He was the best player on the ice. He's a, like every game. I think he was probably if not one of the if not the best player in the country. He was just dominant. Like we were an average. Yeah. Team and he like brought us to the ECAC finals. Not to keep going back on myself, but I remember playing him in prep school, and it just kind of reminded me of playing against Killorn and Benino. I'm like, these guys really are pro. Like, I can't get the puck from them. They're so smart. Um, they battle hard. It's like, oh, I remember at the heart. I was like, I can't defend this guy. I can't defend him. So, They're so strong. Um, they were so strong, too. And then Kerf was just like, he's like one of the most fun players I've ever watched because he's so smart, and he just does like He's always buzzing. Weird. He's like really shifty. He's like Gaudreau. He does these weird little things that like I love people who do like stuff that no one else does. Like, come <laughs> up with like, new shit. Like he just used to make these weirdest like little passes and like moves and like he's just like really fun to watch. Yeah, he fits right in on that Colorado team. Been fun to watch. Yeah. They're all they're all great. Um, all great guys too. Uh, Tommy, yeah. I want to talk to you about a game I was actually in attendance at. Yeah. Um, George, you, I think you have the date. What was the date? It was January 3rd. I think I got 01, 09, 01, January, 09, 2013. Yeah. You were playing yeah. at BU. You were playing your brother. Yeah. First time we played against each other. Yeah. yeah. What, Anyone see my tease? What grade were you in? Well and what grade was he in? Oh, I was a sophomore. He was a freshman. So it was his Okay. Freshman. So you guys yeah. were a year apart. And you want to take us behind that game. It's your first game uh you know playing your younger brother who's you know to this day he's still playing he's in a he's he's had nhl games he's had ahl games so he was a really high hey, player 
Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. Uh, what was that like? It was cra- It was really cool uh, for the obvious reasons. Uh, you know, like Pulse family was there and like P- Pierre came in and interviewed us and they had like a little story on during the game on TV, which was really cool. Um, the game itself, like we were horrible that year. We were like, I think we'd lost eight games in a row going into that. And then we won that. And I think we, we lost like seven in a row. after. <laughs> we were like really bad that year, but we pulled it, we pulled it out. But Why don't you take us through the game. It was, it was what George teased the clip. It was three, one, oh. It was five to two. We were down five to two, I think, with 12 minutes left. <laughs> and then, like, Marsh Everson scores a goal. Luke Griner scores a goal. And then Blackwell has that goal where he, like, he, like flipped it from the blue line and, like, bounced on it. <laughs> with the miracle goal, the Mark Johnson miracle flip. Yeah, it was literally the Mark Johnson. <laughs> but, no, and, I have to – I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm dying because your goal in that game was such, like, a cocky, like, I'm going to come in, dangle, make this sick pass. And you're like, oh. Never mind, that didn't work. Gonna pick it up and go and snipe. But man, yeah. you and your brother were just electric in that game, just trading like goals and sh- and like we'll get to it. But your pass on the last on the winner was sneaky, so good. Oh, thank you. Lot lot of, lot there to go through, but sick game. Yeah. What, uh, what was your fi- what was what was your final stat line versus your brother? So it was a six five Harvard win. What were you? Yeah. What was he had two two goals, one assist, I had one goal, two assists. So three points each. Yeah. He on the winner though, he assisted on the winner. Yeah. yeah. Got him. Were you uh did, did it, what were, what's your relationship with your brother? I mean, like me and my brother, if we ever had the, that moment, I think it almost be I, when I see you and Danny from afar, I feel like you guys are a lot more friendlier than me and my brother would be. That doesn't mean that we're not yeah. as close. It's just a different dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if me and my brother were in that game, it'd be, it'd yeah. be very competitive. I, I'm not saying it wasn't for you, but why don't you take us behind kind of your relationship with him and how it was reflected? You guys, you guys are only a year yeah. apart. No, we're two years apart. Okay. But I did the year in the US. Oh, yeah. um, well, we have, people get people like are pretty surprised when I say this, but me and Danny have never. We've been in a fight or an argument our entire life. So we're like, what? Very, yeah, not a single one. Wow. So we're like very, I mean, generally we're like pretty non-confrontational in general. And then with each other, we just, I don't know, we just don't see anything to get mad about at each other. So we've never you let them get better than you. And so on the ice, um, yeah, we didn't really cross paths too much on the ice a couple of times. I just gave him like a, what's up, Dan? He was like, I was around there like, Daniel. He was like, Thomas. Like it was not looking. Like, it didn't That's change fun. the way we played, but it wasn't, like, overly competitive. Like, we were hacking each other. So, you didn't get, like, at all jazzed up for that game, knowing that national TV against Oh, I for sure was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Pierre's in the booth, yeah. Doc's on the call. It's a show. Yeah. You're Pierre's on the night TV. you were conceived. He knows He knows the exact time <laughs> and date. He, he knows it all. Pierre. He yeah. knows your dad's uh, points in Germany down to his penalty minutes in the playoffs, for sure. Unbelievable. Yeah, dude, that was uh, that was cool though. No, but I was definitely fired up like going into his um when I was I was a little uh like cause he got the first goal and I was like fuck. And then uh, <laughs> but then luckily I I think my goal was in the first, so I like got got it back pretty quick and then I was like able to relax a little. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. why don't you Doc help? had a great call. Sorry. Yeah, he Sorry, did. Ryan. Like I so I work at, I work at NBC and most of my job is you know editing all of Doc's calls and I mean got fired not a big deal that's why we started this podcast but <laughs> <laughs> having Doc Emmerich like a legend of television call one of your goals I just think that's so cool uh, yeah, yeah. So I haven't watched this guy this guy's a, a legend he's a legend so you always have that yeah hearing him say our last name was cool or my yeah and that was um that was uh oh, fuck what was I just gonna say. Ah, whatever, I'll come back to me. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. But um Ryan, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so Tommy, your dad, why don't you just touch upon your dad a little bit before and, and we'll start getting into the 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 post hockey stuff, but why don't you talk yeah. about your dad, um his career. He, he he was a former mass high school star at Matinon. Matinon. Not no longer have a hockey team. Might not even be a school anymore. We don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll it have actually that. is, which is funny, because like a kid I went to um, college with went there, and I was like, I said the same thing. I was like, that place still exists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matt. Like, back in the day, though, it was like a big, like a good hockey, yeah. team, like like one of these big prep schools that you hear about. Yeah. Right. So he was a star at Matinon. He goes on to play four years at BU. Yeah. One 
uh, Beanpot MVP, uh, played under the legend Jack Parker, and then he went over and was up and down in the Penguins organization, correct? And then he went yeah. over to, uh, he ended up having a long career in Europe where you actually were born in Germany. Why don't you just talk about his influence a little bit? Um, I actually know him. He's a, he's an absolute stud. You know, he was he was some, a dad that we all were a little bit terrified of, but also in awe um, growing up, you know, knowing he played in the NHL. And so why don't you just tell us what it was like kind of having him as a dad and his influence on you? Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, he was, uh, yeah, growing up, I saw one of uh, one of Stevie's questions was asking about <laughs> on the bench. Me and him used to get into it a bit on the bench, but because he was always like, he was always pretty hard in like a good way on us. Um, he wasn't like an, one of those like crazy hockey dads, but he was you know if we were like weren't working hard or whatever, he would let us know. Like he'd be like like so I remember like it being one day like at a young age, and this was like good to learn when I was a kid. Was like I came off the ice and I was like. Oh, like I, you see, I scored, and he was like, "Yeah, but like you stuck to us the, the game, like you work hard." And I was like, "Oh, so like, just because you like score doesn't mean you played well." Like, or you always like, he's always like ingrained that like work ethic very young, which is great. And he's like very like humble, salt of the earth guy. So like, he was always a great guy to uh, you know just follow his the way he acted and carried himself and all that. One thing about about him was so again, me and Tommy, uh, we like grew up together, played literally together, and we were on the same some of the same teams. His dad, it, it, it's so funny to think, you used to hate if he was doing infield, hitting your ground balls to warm up. <laughs> yeah. He would rope up. He would absolutely spank him at us. And it yeah, was that, that in practice, he would fire him. Too. Oh, my God. He was throwing as hard as he could in bat in practice. You were lucky. You were lucky to get a bat on a barrel, or the, the barrel on a ball. And yeah. when he was hitting infield, he would, ro- like, no one was hitting him that hard. So every yeah. time he would yeah, rope us up, it would always suck. <laughs> Yeah, he's keeping yeah. everyone on their toes. But, no, he was always very uh, – he was never, like, mean about it or anything. He was just, like, he wanted to, you know, get the best out of us. And he was always good about it. And uh, always, obviously, along the way, I'm sure, like, your dad's, like, teaching little tricks and tricks of the trade yeah. that he learned. It's, it's – uh, it's, I had to ask this because it makes so much sense to me, getting to know your dad a little bit, why our dads are good friends because I think they're similar in that, like, they were such good players, I guess. Um, growing up in mass and then uh, kind of coaching us and um, it just it makes sense to me and I just wanted to see is, is it like I mean I love my father to death is it hard kind of being like damn my dad really like knows more than me and you're kind of that stubborn like I'll figure it out type player is that where like the battles kind of come in for you but even though like obviously they're doing everything they can to teach us the right way and like you said that's a lost that's a lost art these days and it was just probably like a, I was probably just like a like spoiled like when I was like eight like I'd never been like I don't know you know you're just like a spoiled little kid and you're like no like he's like you gotta like, go do this and I'm like I'm like I don't like being yelled at like what is like you know, I, was, I was just probably like, you know, I was just yeah, yeah, yeah. but we uh, but no I think been long he was just trying to help so it took me a while to realize that it wasn't like personal you know he was just trying to get me better. Right. Uh, Tommy, we think you perfectly embody the next shift mindset, and we all have a ton of respect for you to take the the road less traveled kind of in your current career. And why don't you talk about how the game ended for you, uh, you know, how you got yourself to where you are now in the comedy world. And, you know, it's, it, it's certainly not the typical path of a Harvard grad. Um, the, uh, yeah, so it's my – after I – so I was supposed to go play in, uh, in the coast um, – I was like pretty much signed to go play there, uh, but I got another concussion the summer before. So the summer after I graduated, and I had also had like bad like Lyme, problems with like Lyme disease. So I had like I was like Lyme disease and concussion, and that happened throughout Harvard. Like towards the end of my Harvard career, I was getting like I had two concussions, and I was like really sick with Lyme disease. So I had all this shit. So then after another concussion, uh, right before that next fall, I was like if I keep playing. If I play 80 games, I'm just gonna. I'm definitely gonna get one at some point, you know. So like, I don't know if I can like do this. And it was very, very difficult to stop playing for me, um, especially because I didn't have anything planned. Like I didn't even know I wanted to do comedy until I was stopped playing hockey. So not even in college, nothing. Wow. Um, so how it happened was I was literally just sitting at home. So I had to stop playing hockey. I had no resume. I was living at home, like. And uh, I was just looking for like six months, like looking for a job. And I was just like, 
feeling so like unproductive and like I just wanted to like do something like what could I do and I'd always like written down stuff in my computer and like jokes and I don't know ideas for stuff and I was like oh maybe like this will be maybe I could get it like writing or something like that and so I literally just was like maybe I'll try to go tell some jokes like maybe that's I think I could be good at that eventually maybe that's what I'm meant to do so I just tried to I did it like a few times uh, but yeah, it really came from just being like really rattled about not having hockey anymore and trying to find something to do and trying to find like that new path um, from when after when hockey ended. So you write down these jokes. Where where do you send them off? Where uh, how do you how do you kind of how do you test out how do you test out do people think I'm funny? So yeah, I just jot stuff down on my phone throughout the week. And then at the end of the week, I like go through it again, and whatever. Some of the stuff's stupid, some of it's good. So now I like try to flesh out the stuff that was good, write more, and then you got to go on stage and try it. Um, and were so you, you, were you doing like, this in Boston? Like, I did it for like I did like maybe ten open mics in like six months, which is like nothing really. I remember you wouldn't tell me where they were. I remember when we were both yeah. living in Boston, you wouldn't even tell me. You wouldn't let me come see you. Yeah, I didn't let anyone see me probably for like probably a year, just because I didn't. It was because you're not good for like the first few months or six it's like, months. That's like this podcast. Long. You got to put yeah. it out there. Holy shit! Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I did it uh, in Boston for like a few months, and then I was like, I was just like, ah, if I'm gonna do it, like I might as well go where the best people are. So I moved to New York, worked at a restaurant for like eight months while I was looking for a job, and then that's where I started kind of doing some of the barstool stuff, which didn't pan out like in terms of like a formal employment, but I got to do some stuff, which is fun. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then jokes, you just gotta, you gotta try them at like open mics and small shows and stuff like that. Um, I, and sometimes so it don't work. And I wanted to ask, to <laughs> I wanted to ask when you made the decision to kind of try your hand in comedy, was it, I want people to know right away that I am a, a comedian or an aspiring comedian, or I kind of want to just drip that to them over time. Well, I wanted to see how it would, how it would be. Cause after, but then after I started telling people, I was like, I was like, all right, well now I have to do, I have to be good at this. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I was never really nervous about it not ending up going well. Cause I was like, I can't tell people I'm doing this and not be good at it. <laughs> you know? So I just Holy like, shit, I went to Harvard. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're gonna I want to hit on that. Like, was it, was there a, was there a battle with like perception? Like did your dad look at you funny? Like really like comedy or like, because Obviously, when you go to Harvard, Sean hit on this earlier, you're going to go finance, whatever else. I mean, it's like the last kind of thing. So, I don't yeah. know. We, we respect taking that kind of step where it's it's hard because there's a lot of eyes that might look at you and be like, no way. Right? Yeah. Yeah, my parents were very supportive the whole time, really. they The only thing I said was, like, the most they ever said was, like, make sure you have a backup plan. You know, don't, like... Just make up your backup plan, keep a job for a while, see how it goes. But they're always very supportive of me pursuing it. And, yeah, in terms of the Harvard thing, yeah. Um, well, luckily, I mean, my personality, I don't think anyone's expecting me to go into finance anyways. So that kind of that helped. I was always, like, trying to do something creative. Uh, and I'm just too big of a like clown to do anything that most Harvard people do. You know, when you're – uh, growing up as a hockey player, you know that, all right, I, there's this like subset of people that I'm competing against that are quote unquote hockey players in comedy or, or trying to garner attention online um, with humor. You're competing again against pretty much everyone with a cell phone that can, you know, create content and throw it out there. So talk me through kind of your like artistic process balanced with I have to promote myself. I need to be pumping out content all the time. Yeah, it is. It is tough nowadays because you can. Um, I wish it was more just like you could do. I like. I don't want to have to do all that. Yeah. Like I wish it was more. Like, oh, you could go to tell jokes and do just the stand up. Um, and now it's tough because if people, because comedy clubs just want to like 
fill seats. Like they just right. want to make money. So if if like a YouTube star who's like not that funny yeah. can do a comedy club, they'll get booked. Right. So it's like you kind of have to do it. Like it's such a good thing to do these days. Uh, most of it's just about having a following these days. Yeah, yeah. But and I imagine so, that before, yeah. you know, it the barrier to entry was greater in that you could just say, okay, I have what it takes to get on stage and try these out. Um, and so that's, you're already like halfway there. And now there's people that yeah. are like, I don't care if I get laughed at when I put something up on, Twi you know, uh, TikTok. So. <laughs> yeah, there's just like so much more, like such a wider, or more diverse medium now. Like, yeah, uh, it's uh, so that it is one thing I have to get better at is just like got to start doing more regular content, stuff like that. Uh, the podcast is another yep. way to followers so tell so us about just, tell us about the podcast it sorry, can i can i interject there real quick before yeah. we go into the pod sorry i gotta ask um <laughs> is there a certain sense of like pride with stand-up guys versus like the youtube stars and be like guys we're actually on stage here like yeah can't just edit shit. and you guys are like fuck that yeah. kind of or yeah i gotta hear about that what's that rivalry right like because man we were talking. There's some funny dudes on uh, YouTube. This Joey Molinaro guy is yeah. cracking me up. So. Some people are talented. Some of them are funny for sure. I'm not. I'm not too <laughs> admit. That. I'm not that much of like a stand-up purist. Where like I can't admit that. There's obviously a lot of funny people on like Instagram, YouTube, everywhere, YouTube. But um, but yeah, definitely. It's also probably a little bit maybe bitterness too. But yeah, a lot of it is like, yeah, it's just not because you're not. I don't know, like doing stand-ups just such like uh, it seems harder, but I guess a lot of what these people do like takes a lot of effort and time and it's just a different type of thing. I don't yeah, know. it's like a completely it's different you and process. You're alone and yeah. you can't fuck up. Yeah. What's that feeling like? What's that feeling like being like, oh my and God. And like, actual jokes, like some of them are very silly and like dumb. Like it takes a lot of work <laughs> uh, to like come up with a joke. Like way, like a ton of work to like, yeah, work. It takes months to like get a joke to be perfect, and so it makes sense that comedians are like seeing people get famous on Instagram when they're posting like twenty second videos every few days, like just kind of being silly. Yeah, I, I need to go in here. Some of them are funny. I need to go in here. Um, with with the <laughs> shit, I'm starting to lose it over here. With the stand up, like when you go out there and say like you you think you, you got this brilliant first joke, and the crickets come. You're know, like, does the doubt start to creep in? Like, are you starting to panic? Or you're like, all right, next joke, or is it like, man, this crowd is tough? Or what's going through your head? Or you just on yeah. the next one? Um, I'm at the point now where if if I'm trying new jokes, it's usually in like the middle. So what you want to do is you start off strong for like a few minutes. If you're doing like ten minutes, start off strong. If you want to try something new, like maybe throw it in the middle, and then you can end strong. That's kind of a strategy. But sometimes in your like your fundamental jokes, kind of like yeah, you know this one's gonna on hit. Side, you can get them laughing, get them on your side, and then try to sneak one in and see if it does well. Because you don't want to open with a new one, obviously. Because then if it doesn't work, you're kind of screwed. If you're, it's tough to dig <laughs> out. It's tough to dig out of that. If I've done, if I'm doing real shows, I kind of I know I'm gonna do stuff that works. Um, and maybe I'll sneak try to sneak something new in the middle. But for the most part, if it's like a big show, I do what I know works, so I know it's gonna go well. But when I'm trying new jokes, it's usually it's smaller shows or like, so like, and if something doesn't go well, I'm at the point now where I'm more just like mad. It's not funny than feeling like terrified because I've been doing it like a few years now. So it still does. I still do get like nervous sometimes once in a while, but mostly if something doesn't work, I'm more just like, Dad, I thought that was funny. Damn it. Instead of being like, instead of feeling like terrified. That's when I feel like the greats, like, I think I might have uh, asked you about this earlier, but some of like the greats, like Chappelle or Robin Williams, like if it, I feel like they'd go after a single guy in the crowd and kind of be like, "Dude, like, come on, like, what's yeah. your deal?" And kind of go off of them, and then everyone starts dying laughing. But yeah. who's, so if you're not who's some of your that. inspirations, like growing up? On top of that, who are some um, of your inspirations? I say way back. Up? I don't know if you remember this, cop, but I was obsessed with uh, Bo Burnham. Yeah. yeah. I was obsessed, <laughs> obsessed with that guy. He's a genius. But so in high school, he was like my guy. I was obsessed with him. And then stand, like, and he's like a genius. He's had a few stand up specials. But uh, other than that, like, um, like uh, John Mulaney, Mike Birbiglia, uh, Nate 
Hey, Fargazzi. My favorite guy of all time is Louie. CK. And then, like, yeah, 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 yeah. We won't want that. Oh, out there. We won't. We won't. I got to debate you here. I got to debate you here. Robin yeah. Williams, Chappelle, Chris Chappelle Rock. I mean, yeah, Chappelle's definitely. Cat Williams. Cat Williams is unbelievable. Chappelle's Cat definitely Cliff, probably, the, probably the best. But my favorite <laughs> is Louie. You can bleep that out. Louis. Oh. Uh, Tommy, talk about the annual uh, Laughing with Your Buddies charity show for the Travis Roy Foundation. Oh, yeah, and Bill Burr, obviously. Yeah, he's up there, too. He's amazing. Um, um, yeah. yeah, so well, you and your brother started this how long ago? And just kind of expand on that. And then, obviously, you had Bill Burr this past year. So Yeah, so three, three years ago, me, Dan, and Dave left for a, It was really, I think, Dan and Dave's idea. And they came to me about it. And so the first time we did it, we got together, like, a few Boston comedians – and myself, and we went to Lansdowne Pub um, right across from Fenway. I think there was like 100 people there, and it was to raise money for the Travis Roy Foundation. So all the tickets and all that stuff, raffle, all that, went to the Travis Roy Foundation, um, which helped spinal, spinal cord injuries, if, you don't, if you're not aware. And, um, and so that was the first year was at Lansdowne, and then the second year we did it at, uh, we did at Laugh Boston. Someone knows like the guy who owns lap boston and so we did it there and it sold out there it was like 300 people or something and it was me and a few other my comedian friends from new york and then this is crazy this is a crazy story so so it, when travis like got when the injury occurred like way back when uh bill burr is like a, from boston he's like a sports fan and he heard about travis roy's injury and he had reached out to travis and was like hey if you ever want me to do like a charity show anything like that like let me know and like 10 years went by and he can't, he reached out once in a while nothing really materialized but then like then like 12 years later or something whatever it is uh 15 however long ago that was he uh travis reached out to him and was like hey these guys have been doing a show these last two years uh for our foundation like would you want to join and bill burr's just like yeah sure wow and so then we went to the then we went from laugh boston to the wilbur theater which is like 1,300 people or something. So then I got to open for him, which was just surreal. Um, that's incredible. It's crazy. Talk about so, – yeah, that's that's a great story and such a great cause. Um, talk about your friendships within the comedy world. Like how different are comedy people than hockey players? I feel like we're – Nick Petrecki said this last, last episode. We're kind of wired the same way. Are, are these people wired a little different? Well, or are they just kind of like hockey every, players? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really – like jive with most comedians not like i'm better than them or they're better than me just like they're just different people they're all are they I, introverts I like are they really introverted I, yeah a lot of them are very nice people because a lot of them are like pretty insecure and introverted <laughs> all of them are crazy every single yeah. one of them crazy. i'm crazy and i'm the most normal one <laughs> <laughs> um but there are a lot of them are just like but a lot of them are nice people and they're just like obviously pretty funny and just like there's a different type of person but i have a good crew of people that i'm friends with which is kind of all you need i have like maybe five or six pretty close friends um but it is definitely like a community type thing is it hard to make your dad laugh or because i could just see like one of our dad just being there and just being like this nah, he not, getting it. not getting it he nah, likes he it and they've uh They've seen me do it a bunch now, so and I don't do yeah. too much material that's like uncomfortable for them. But like one of one of our one of our uh, fans <laughs> begs to differ. Yeah, this is a great fan question from Stevie. Yeah. Sorry, you might already know it. Uh, no, it's from just Tony. Keep going, what you're saying. I know that's why I was gonna. I, was gonna I didn't know if I'm allowed to say it or not. I'm allowed to bring it up though. What an idiot. Uh, yeah, so that's my that's like, but I don't do that many dirty jokes. But that joke about like, am I allowed to say it? Yeah, joke? you can say it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're, we're this is an eighth grade uh, review. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a joke about like, Bergeron! my parents and like, I guess the first time I did that, they were I was a little nervous, but they don't they didn't care at all. But they, they've seen me so many times now that nothing really. Oh, doesn't great. it's not really that weird plus i don't really do that many like i don't do any dirty jokes or anything yeah yeah i'm sure I'm but sure. uh <laughs> but that one uh, yeah one. what is your alley of comedy like what makes you laugh what do you like what don't you like 
just like mostly observational stuff like uh not, not big like not a huge like nothing political like i don't like political jokes i don't like i don't like really dirty jokes uh just like personally like some people can get away with it i also don't think i could like get away with it <laughs> it's just like not like you got to go with kind of what your vibe is so i just do like yeah, yeah. a lot of observation <laughs> yeah. a lot of like top like top not topical but like i guess worldly issue like it's in like, terms of, like like family guy media. family guy like situational yeah. stuff yeah. i have a couple like right. jokes and i don't know hit us with like a couple of your like go-to's right now i just want to see if i'm gonna laugh <laughs> um i'm actually i'm working on a joke right now about about like let me just pull it up even it's about uh, <laughs> about like lime i'm bringing up like lime wire about how how different I'm already I'm already laughing because my dad used to get so <laughs> fucking mad yeah. if we had LimeWire this, like downloading. This, this has like four thirty words. So many it. viruses. Yeah. Well dude, this is what I this is what I say. It's like a lot's changed now there's Spotify app music and shit. When I was a kid you had to illegally down music from LimeWire and every time you download from LimeWire you'd give your computer a little bit of herpes. <laughs> And I, like I would just riddle my parents, yeah, yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, just deny it. But then it would be like, <laughs> so then I go talk about LimeWire, which I think is I've tried a few times. It does it does well. I think it's relatable enough. Basically, Lime, <laughs> it has like a couple, whatever. I'll just read. That's it. all right. So it's basically like LimeWire is like big database of songs and videos and how LimeWire worked was you'd go into LimeWire and be like, all right, I want to find a song, and LimeWire would be like, all right, here's mostly porn. <laughs> and you'd be like, no, I just wanted the song. And they'd be like, oh, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> and then you had to like comb through the results to find the song. Oh, man. That's and it was crazy. Like, whatever you searched on LimeWire, no matter what, how innocent it was, there was porn related to what you searched. <laughs> like, oh, you'd, be, you'd be like, oh, like red hot chili peppers. And they'd be like, hot red. The <laughs> and you're like, oh, how does that exist? That's so <laughs> oh man and then your parents are like what the fuck You're like no no the song the song <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah holy oh. shit all right well that oh, that was man, pretty that was a good one. good no, that was a good Sorry, one. inappropriate no, no we, 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 we said we said ear before. we said earmuffs before you went so it's all good i mean it's tommy good. like is there is there anything that you went through hockey wise that you think like prepared you for you know, whether it was uh, any discouragement along the way, comedy-wise? Um, yeah, kind of what we went back to what we were talking earlier, like in, uh, in like high school getting cut or, you know, here and there, if you're like battles with the coach and stuff like that. Yeah. Just back to that, like, uh, just like the resilience thing and, you know. You must do, do um... on stage, you got to be used to that, um, like getting reject rejection. You well, know? to that to that point, like when you see a guy like Pat McAfee, um, kind of go from a, a professional football career to to comedy, can you like, does that resonate with you? Do you, you ever think to try to collab with him in some way? Because it's not, I mean, there's not a ton of athletes that that kind of have that share the the athlete background going into yeah. uh, comedy. Francis was another oh, uh, Francis, Harvard yeah. guy too, wasn't he? Yeah, I don't know. I, didn't know him. I, don't, I don't know if he was an athlete, but yeah, he played lacrosse. I didn't know him at school. He graduated the year that I went in, so I never overlapped. But when I told, we were good buddies with the like lacrosse guys, and they were like, "Oh, you should reach out to this guy. He's been stand up." And I've become very close with him, and he's a great guy. He's been very helpful and very nice, and yeah. you know, in my, in my first couple of years. Um, and so he was the one who like pulled had me like come and write some sketches with him on bar stool which was fun um but he's a great guy and he's yeah so he's another one and it's been so clutch to have someone just like who's similar to you and like in the athlete thing and who's, who's like a couple of years ahead of me in the comedy stuff so has got good advice and all that yep. kind of stuff uh i think sean kind of talked to this earlier but t take us through that whole bar stool thing with like what was prez like was it nuts and how funny is this that a kid I worked with at NBC 
literally so my first job is a logger so you're just watching nhl games and writing out the time codes and the kid i sit next to ends up doing uh a challenge and he tells me you know i was an extra in uh house of cards they go no way he goes yeah yeah i was an extra i was a bodyguard didn't believe my put it on the kid's an extra in that he goes on marty mush goes on the thing and wins i'm like I was just sitting next to this kid, and now he's his I job like, is really like, amazing. Wait, you worked with that kid? <laughs> yeah, he was a logger. No NBC, way. And, I, he, and a logger, guys, a logger is literally like you're digging bitches, guys. Like, and then imagine <laughs> that he's like, Fuck it. I like what I want to like do. Party. Get me the fuck out of here. I was like, this kid. And when you look at him, like, no way. Yeah, dude, it was weird. The idol thing was weird. It was so like unorganized. No one was going. Like, it was it was very stressful. Like, yeah. I, it was br- it was like kind of it was pretty brutal. Experience. I remember was, thinking, Tommy. I remember thinking, was, Tommy, like how difficult that must have been for you because you know you were already kind of exactly. getting your foot uh, in the door there, and then all of a sudden they say, "Oh yeah, you're just going to be a part of this uh, challenge." I I didn't want to do it for like months, for a couple yeah. months. Like you should do it, like, and I'd be like, and I was like, I don't like, I feel weird because I've already done stuff yeah. with you, and so like. I don't want to go in and people are like, oh, doesn't he like already work? It was just like, I didn't yeah. want that attention. And like, so like best case scenario, I would have won and people would have been like, oh, well, he already was like working here. What the hell? But worst or, case, it's or, like, are you guys just going to gas me? Like, oh, he's already yeah. working here and he didn't win. So it was yeah. a lose lose for me. But <laughs> the last minute I was like, all right, whatever. Like, what do I have to lose? Yeah. And then, yeah. So nothing ever, like, I did like a few months of like writing sketches with Francis before yeah. that. And then after that, nothing really happened. But that thing wasn't wasn't much fun. It was kind of it was pretty tough. Uh, yeah, I could imagine. That'd I be think stressful. Prez though, like Prez is such a commanding force. And either if you're a comedian or doing what we're doing, he's kind of like an idol for us. And talk he's about terrible. his like command, like it's crazy. And like Ryan talked about it too. He's just unboxing shit, and people oh, can't he, get enough. Like he really <laughs> is like the king of content. He's the funniest guy. Like he's so yeah. fun. And I'm it was it was pretty. It was like I've been reading bars since I was like 14, like when it started. So I was just like, it was pretty cool to be in there uh, with those guys and like do some sketches with them. And they, the, it was tough because they don't like stand up, right? Like, and so what? And we had to do an audition for it. So you'd yeah. walk in, and I went first because they were like, "Oh, you were trying to know some people. Like, you can go first. Like, ease everyone in." So I had to go first. So I walked in the office, like lights <laughs> on, like people scattered about, like not, <laughs> not a like situation conducive to laughter. Yeah, and, like I think some people like chuckled maybe, but like it's like, not a great. We gotta get these clips. It's, we it's, get these it clips. is. It's such a lose lose type of uh, environment. I didn't want to do it for months, and for, I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, I, what do I have to lose? And then it's like, yeah, it was a lose lose. It's but, almost like that type of thing was better for someone who's okay with people laughing at you. The P, yeah, than, yeah, you know, yes. there are more people who are like. You have to be like a, like a kind of a character. It's almost yeah, like right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> I just love how ruthless president is on those things. Oh, He's like, get out, you're done. <laughs> it's like so ruthless. So oh ruthless. man, should we? Uh, should Tom, we get why don't you plug some... your uh, your your podcast? Tell us what what you're doing, yeah. who you're doing it with, and and how it kind of came about. Yeah. So um, me and my so my best comedian uh, my best friend and like comedy world's girl louisa lang she went from wellesley she went to bc really cool really funny um and so we were just like she's like kind of the same we both like start at the same time and we both just like headline carolines at the same time so we're like kind of on the same similar trajectory at the moment not that we're like anybody right now but we're in the <laughs> early stages oh, hope of sure. hopefully one day what will be a trajectory <laughs> same here same here yeah and so uh, we started a podcast. It's, uh, nobody under nobody asked. It's called, it's called so it's nobody underscore asked underscore pod, and it's just about us giving our uninformed opinions on whatever we feel like. It's pretty it's pretty loosely structured. It's gonna be us just kind of shooting the breeze and talking about. We have a few segments in there, but yeah, it's um hopefully it goes well. Have you guys tested it out? Have you done like a lime wire joke for sure? Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys tested it out or done any pilots? Because this this stuff is hard. Like yeah, you you think you can just like get a mic and um, press record, and then you're like, oh my god, Show this up. is, is that a Yeti? impossible. Yeah, you have. To, I mean, these. Wait, yeah, I gotta see this thing. What's that? Let's see it. Yeti. Get a pop filter and everything. Look at that bad boy. 
I nah, love it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no. Right, we, uh, uh, yeah, it was pretty. We just like it was. We only did one so far, and it was it was fun. But you know, it'll get it'll hopefully get a lot better. You guys are doing doing good though here. I mean, we're okay. like recording, and Long way that's go. about it. Yeah. <laughs> good questions though. I got the questions good. early. Some of those, and I was like, you "Guys, putting in the work." Tommy, so obviously the name of the podcast is Next Shift, and it's kind of, you know, fitting to have a guy like you on who, you know, not too many people are taking a Next Shift kind of the way you are and going the road you are in the in the comedy world. Why don't you just kind of, you know, if you have anything you can touch upon that hockey kind of gave gave you for this second chapter and, you know, maybe was there ever a time when you needed to – kind of fall back and have kind of that mantra you know next shift i gotta go you know whether it be that first time you decided to take the stage that second time you know just kind of go off of that in terms of next shift as well like what's next in the comedy world how is it evolving and how how are you going to adapt and evolve in the comedy world yeah um so yeah for for rye's question i think just like what you'd expect sports to give you just the competitiveness and um, you know, wanting to be the best and all that kind of stuff, which you need in comedy for sure. It's definitely, it's more individual, obviously, than a team, but, you know, it's such a, it's it's like, you know, playing in the NHL, making it to, you know, Netflix, similar. There's so, only so many yeah. spots. You got to have that mindset where you got to um, just you get knocked down, get back up again. Get, where you know, where are you at right now on the quest to net, uh, Netflix special? Like, what league are you playing in? Are you in, like, um... Are you in, like, midget AAA right now? I'm not quite there. Um, so I'm, like, I've been there like three and a half years now. Which in comedy, is like, very, very early. Like, yeah. I've heard so you're, you're still a squirt. I've been in, like, eight years. Like, I'm still, like, early. Yeah. So, like, it takes a long time to do it. So I'm still really uh, young in it, which is good news. Because I think so far it's going pretty well. Um, so I'm at a pretty good pace. But, you know, definitely still a little bit away from, you know, doing arenas. Hopefully one day, but um, but yeah. So you just gotta just gotta keep having that edge, and uh, yeah. In the future, I don't. It's gonna be weird after this. I'm not sure because uh, uh, that's a. I I hope. I don't know when crowds are gonna get. That's one thing yeah. you need a crowd for <laughs> more yeah. than anything. <laughs> so hopefully it gets back to normal at some point, and then after this, just keep networking trying to get into clubs maybe take some like acting class at some point i took an acting class this fall so i think one eventually maybe like parlay stand up and acting that's what like a lot of comedians do yeah. so who knows just try and dip my toes into a lot of different waters i don't know if that's a saying yeah and it is like now. you have to get into the so it's like you have to get into the social media game at this point yeah. how hard is it to make someone laugh off a tweet though i think that's and i see a lot, a lot of them like, I think you're a big uh, tweet comedy guy. Isn't it hard to make someone laugh off a tweet? Yeah, it can be. And the, some people are just better at some things. Like, some people are good at posting videos themselves, talking. They're funny. Some people are better at tweets. Um, so yeah, you you're the writer. Good at. So I just got to gotta find my niche and definitely, yeah, for sure, try to grow the social media aspect of it, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I just keep thinking of that Joey. This is the funniest guy I've seen since Prez, I think. This guy has me in tears every night, guys. Like, it's so stupid, too. Like, some of them. He, he's, it's the easy, it's just, easy, though, for, really like, an imitator, right? Like, if you're an yeah, imitator, yeah. you don't yeah. have to, you don't have to, like, think of what the, you just, you can take anything and say it, and it's hilarious. Yeah. Caliendo was the original. Guy. Yeah. Tommy, we talked about this. Frank yeah. Caliendo, I watched his Todd McShay. Unbelievable. He's, he's talented. Unbelievable. He's talented. Yeah, he, he does a lot of people and he nails them. Yeah. Nails them and people forget, though, and then the next impersonator comes. Well, it's like Frank Caliendo already conquered this kind of, but still how hilarious. Dumb, how dumb was it that he got, like, his own TV show? Like, what do you – Yeah. I, I like, I get you were popular, but you can give an impression of the TV True. show. Obviously, it lasted well, four episodes. Read one before you go, Sean, because I, I hit up some of your teammates. Um, I don't know if people ever heard of NHL star Jimmy VC. Well, we got a fan question from Jimmy VC. Actually, a two-parter, two-part question guy. Talk about coming into Harvard one year, 220 with an afro. <laughs> Actually, it's not a two-parter. That's the only one. Go. 
Uh, yeah, I was. I mean, high school. I was. We were. Cop was mentioned in my ass earlier. I was a sick boy. You should have seen these kids' boxers. <laughs> they were. They would have been a like, sweatshirt on George. Not they even were like cargo George. shorts huge. for anyone else. They were huge. I was like, I think I was like a weight 36, 38 waist in high school. Yeah, to protect the puck. Yeah. Protect the puck. Yeah, so good yeah, corner so I came, weight. I, for some reason, thought my hair looked okay. So I came in with a legit like afro, and I was like two sixteen, two seventeen, as a freshman. I looked ridiculous. <laughs> was your coach? Did picture. you have a? Uh... <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we need a picture of that. But uh, one of the things I like to ask people is going off of that. Do you have a, uh, a memory of when your coach really hated you, like Tommy? Wake the fuck up. Um, probably. That day he saw you with the afro and 220. <laughs> um, no, he actually named, he actually started calling me Tommy Fro Regan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's your handle, right? Yeah, it used to be my handle. Yeah, Teddy made that up, so I guess he was wasn't too opposed to it. There you um, go. Yeah, I was, was a big boy. I had a lot a lot of weight fluctuation. Then I had the uh, then I had a parasite and I lost 40 pounds. Remember that? Did you ever see me during that? Wait, that's nuts. Wow. Was it Lyme? Lyme disease? Lyme disease and Man, I talk, night where I was like throwing up all the time. It was crazy. So I lost. Talk like, about it. I'm from like 215 to like 180 in like six months. Wow. Talk about adversity. That that disease is straight up adversity, man. I, yeah. I've seen a couple of people go through it. It is no joke. So yeah. how did you handle that? It was like, bro. It was like while I was playing too, I couldn't really explain it to anyone. Like no one, cause no one knew what it was, and I was just like, I feel terrible. I'm like losing all this weight, but no one knew. My coaches were didn't know what it was, like, and yeah. trainers, and I, and no one. So I was just playing through it. I was eating like a piece of toast every day. That's it. Or else I'd throw it up. It was crazy. Yeah. And like the hockey culture too. It's like, why aren't you playing? Yeah. It's like, dude, yeah. I'm actually dying. Yeah. Like, I can't play. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Irish Catholic dad. Yeah, like, I, you know, like, get out there. Gunner was asking, do you have any <laughs> off the top uh, men's league uh, stories? I think I know why he wrote that because Gunner joined our men's league team last year. He played like four games. I think got in like five fights. Oh my god. <laughs> He was literally just trying to start fights, and everyone was like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, he needed to go back to the ECHL and actually start fighting people. Yeah. Yeah, didn't he? He actually lost his teeth, too, with a visor, didn't he? Or, I don't remember. He was, a, he was a madman for a few weeks. Wow. And, he, and, I, and then I think he retired. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have to. I, I remember going through the same shit at Chelsea. Like, I didn't fight, obviously, but just being like, after you retire, going back to the men's league, like, and there's like other college kids out there just buzzing around. Like I, yeah. I was so fucking mad that I didn't play for like, I need like a three year break. Yeah. So I was like, if I'm gonna be out here, like I have to train. Like I'm not coming out here like yeah. handicapped. Yeah. Teams go like, like one of the teams in the league's like the fire department. Um, oh, aren't they like just chip oh. and change four lines like yeah. work you? Yeah, they're just all they go all out. They have like two teams. They have a coach on the bench. <laughs> Apparently, during the hat. If you're on the A team, you, like, get sh the shift off to go play. And so, like, they take it wicked seriously. They have, like, a coach and two goalies and shit. It's crazy. Jeez. Yeah, so those games are no fun. Playing the, play the New York Fire Department at 1130. And yeah, that, I'm, my palms are sweating just thinking of that. <laughs> so the games are really, like, one in the morning. Like, what the fuck am I doing yeah. here? Yeah. Well, at 1130, which is asinine. Like, like I'm such a men out after that. Like you have to yeah. go grab beers in New York at that point. Well, that's even too late for like, cause then it's like two a.m. or yeah, yeah, one one thirty. So even that, it's ever because they're usually on Thursdays. So, but like the earlier games you do, there's like eight thirty, ten, and eleven thirty. So like eight thirty and ten will go up for a few after. I'm such a mental midget about hockey after like trying to play in like the top men's leagues in Chelsea where like I was getting so frustrated so it took me it took a four year break and then I was like I'm joining a bunch of older guys where we just play our friends every time because if you're not playing against your friends out there it's just like there's gonna be fights like yeah. it's still hockey but I, mean, it's I think Ryan plays in a great league I think for uh, for men's league it's, that's, it's the league. best men's league in the country actually ranked wait actually <laughs> look it up my hockey rankings there one in Connecticut 
Yeah, Monster check it out. Connecticut. Uh, oh, team, green, team Green this year, pretty, pretty good, pretty good year. <laughs> I didn't score like at all this year. It was bad. Like if I had to go back and guess in like a maybe a twelve week season, so call that eight games, ten, eight to ten games, might have had three goals. That's all right. You defenseman. No. No, I'm not even gonna let that go. I played forward Wait. a lot. Were you there for Ryan's uh, Latang game? He likes to call or talk about some of these stories that Ryan tells me. Just crack me up from Sebs, where he's like, "You should have seen my Latang game. Should have seen my uh, Richard's just give game." Your best, give your best <laughs> Ryan Coffee high school hockey story. What's the Latang game? I don't know. That that that's just what he calls it. I don't know. I, oh, I, 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 know I think he's, he's literally about. put words in my mouth for years now. I don't know what. I know the story you're talking about when we were. Uh, I don't want to tell. It's just I don't want to give it to you. But when you had the the twenty dollars on the wall. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to tell. Them. You got to tell. I remember exactly. What was it? we were down? So we were. Uh, it was. I think it was our like. It might have been our senior game. Yeah. Yeah, it was like senior game. Against, uh, against governors. Yeah. We're, so me and Tommy were both at St. Sebastian's. We were seniors. It was our last home game. We weren't going to any playoff. We stunk. So we were go- that was going to be our last game at home. Played governors. After the second, so in between the second and third, our coach comes in. Uh, coach Sean McCann came in, and he had 20 bucks, and he tapes it up on the wall. And he goes, all right, whoever scores the winner, this is yours. And he just walked out. I actually really appreciated it. I really did. And Kopp was playing I'm, D at this time, by the way. Right? I'm playing defense. I just stand up. I stand up. I go. I grab it. And I put it in my locker. But you and didn't then, score? No, and then. Eight minutes left in the game, probably. Eight to, like, six minutes. I score to take the lead. I remember being in the huddle and people were like, you motherfucker. <laughs> like, that's such a joke. Are you kidding me? And to this day, I'll remember like it was like it was just Peter yesterday. Burke. Burke. Peter Burke. He ended up going on to play lacrosse at Bucknell, and is now the head coach of Holy Cross lacrosse. Um, he just gives an. It was as if he was passing it in front of Cody Ferriero, who was a draft pick at the San Jose Sharks. Tape the tape right in front. It was so bad. Cody Ferriero went over and slapped Burke on the pads. After <laughs> the yeah. Gave him the patch ready. Oh, so you didn't win. Oh, you, t- yeah. you tied. No, long story short, Tommy scores the OT winner and did like the Jesus Christ celebration in front of And then you had to section. give him twenty dollars. Oh my god! <laughs> Wait, I got what's the cel- what's the celebration? I think I saw someone do. I was just like being an idiot. I think I saw someone do it. Uh, it was like you just put your arms back like this. <laughs> that's, um, that's funny. That's so wrong. It's like a basketball celebration. I did it for like our one eight person section. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. There's a video of it still online, I think. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. Guys, I have to go get my order at five guys for ten PM. Wow. Dial. Dial. I was uh, I was good, right? Yeah, that, that was good. good. All right, That's awesome, so let's... guys. So fun. No, well, Tommy, thanks for coming on, man. We appreciate it. It was awesome. Oh, <laughs> I don't think we expected to laugh as hard as we did, so um Thanks for adding some spice. I love yeah. it. Thanks Why for having me. It's good catching up with you guys. Give us one last plug for your, your podcast if you want. So it's nobody asked, and it's uh, nobody underscore asked underscore pod. Awesome. Yeah. When's the release date? Um, now, I think next this upcoming Tuesday. But So we'll, yeah. we'll make sure we release these in, uh, you know, different days so we're not uh, competing against each other. We're not fighting for, <laughs> yeah, fighting we'll be, for we'll eyeballs We'll be a yeah. lot, lot of podcasts out, out there. Yeah. What the fuck am I talking about? Fight for years. <laughs> actually, can I can I get a torch tantrum rant in here? And actually, yeah. you know, I love Killorn, but like, Carrick, these NHLers, stop podcasting. We need to podcast. Like, we don't yeah, need your you podcast. Have you guys have wait fifty million dollars. We're Kill- grinding out here. I can't have these NHL guys start podcasts. Ooh, Killorn podcast. did. Killorn just paint. did the did the deck. He does like the the doc talk or something. I mean, it's great. It's great content, like great causes. But like, think of the think of the guys in the coast, boys. Like, you already made the show. Who's, <laughs> who's podcasting? Oh, oh Killorn's got Doc Talk and like Carrick and like I just 
Boys, it's a dog fight out here for eyeballs. Like, enough. You got a hundred million. Dog fight for eyeballs. Oh my god. 